What's up everybody and welcome to this month's Patreon pick video of which I will be doing two. So next week look out for another one of these top tens that was picked by my patrons. And this week we're going to be talking about my top ten favorite movie characters. And being that this is a Patreon pick video, obviously, I need to tell you what Patreon is. That is my crowdfunding source. If you check the video description of every single one of my videos, you will find the link to that. There's multiple tiers with different perks, different things that I tried to give back to my patrons. But these are people that enjoy and believe in what I do so much in this channel that they wanted to give back financially and help fund the channel, help expand what I am able to do. And so once a month, I do one of these videos where they actually pick the topic. And this was the number one choice this month. And this video, will We'll also have a companion video over exclusive to my Patreon, and that is going to be another 10 of my favorite movie characters. So if you enjoyed this video and you want to see what the other 10, basically my 11 through 20, what they would be, and you want to give back to this channel and become one of those financial backers, definitely check out that link down below. You can join at any tier and get access to that video, but different tiers do offer different levels of value. So check all that out, make the best decision for you, and thank you so much for considering that. And going along with all of those awesome people on Patreon, this video is also brought to you by the awesome people at HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that brings fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes right to your doorstep. My wife and I both work full-time jobs, and before recently, I pretty much worked two full-time jobs. So every single day, it seemed like a Herculean task to get a home-cooked meal on the table that wasn't hot dogs or frozen pizza. HelloFresh helps tremendously by offering quick and easy recipes that take as few as 20 minutes to complete with easy cleanup and even low prep options. So you can spend less time stressing over what to cook, cleaning your kitchen after a meal, and even make fewer trips to the grocery store. Variety is the spice of life, and they have a huge variety in the types of meals that they offer so that you can break the boredom with your weekly menu and have options that appeal to every family member's taste. They also offer a multitude of healthier options like family friendly, fit and wholesome, pescatarian, and veggie options, and all of which come with fresh produce that are sourced directly from farmers. Use the link below in the video description or go to HelloFresh.com and use my code CodyLeach16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. So if you're ready to take the stress and the boredom out of everyday cooking and become a user of HelloFresh, be sure to check out that description down below for the link and the code. And now let's talk about my top 10 favorite movie characters. Starting off at number 10 is going to be Sarah Connor. This is a character that I took a lot of heat for putting her at the top of my top 10 final girls list. I do think she qualifies as a final girl, but I'm not going to make that argument again here. Go check out that video. Nonetheless, this is a character that I think is one of the greatest of all time. Certainly one of my favorites of all time. I adore the first two Terminator films, especially the second one. I'm one of the few people that really liked how that character returned and how that character was utilized in Terminator Dark Fate. That entire story arc of just this average, everyday woman who works at a diner and then finds out that she's actually the mother of the savior of humanity. And how she progresses, even just in those first two movies, from this regular lady into, just by the end of the first Terminator, she's basically a soldier at that point that just took out this unstoppable killing machine single-handedly. And then in the second film, it's one of those few times where we really, really showcase like the physical transformation of a female actor to where Linda Hamilton put on so much muscle and just toned her body to the point where she looked like a machine herself in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And the character is totally different in that second film. It's a great little arc to where in the second film, she is almost devoid of humanity in a certain degree, to the point where she has abandoned her son, she has kind of by choice, kind of not by choice, just become a bit of a deadbeat mother. And when she's reunited with him, you start to see those qualities come back out where she cares obviously very much for her son and those emotions start to take over. You watch the director's cut, you still see that pain that comes back from her love from Kyle Reese, the guy that came back from the future in the first film and became the father of John, and all the way even to Dark Fate to where she is this tortured soul that has lost her son but is still just relentlessly fighting through vengeance. I just think that she's one of the most fully realized female characters in movie history. And one of the reasons why Dark Fate worked so much for me when it didn't work for a lot of other people is that I was very easily convinced of this new storyline that they were going on where John was kind of no longer the point anymore past getting Judgment Day to stop. 
and the movie kind of reframed everything as Sarah Connor was always the point. She was always the focal point. She was always the important one. And she's just such a fascinating and well-rounded character that I was easily going on that journey. Number nine is going to be Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Now, Spider-Man's one of those rare characters where he has had multiple generations of certain iterations of the character. You have a certain generation that grew up and loves Tobey. You have a certain generation that's very dedicated to Andrew Garfield. A lot of the younger generation loves Tom Holland and the MCU Spider-Man. And especially with No Way Home and all of the, the magic that we got out of the third act of that film, it just kind of reinforced that I have always loved this version of the character. I know some people make fun of it, some people don't get it, it's a little dated for some. I get all of that. I grew up with this Spider-Man. I was 10 years old when the first one came out. This was kind of one of my main introductions to a lot of the different storylines of Spider-Man because I never really read the comics a whole lot. I always played the video games, always watched the animated series, but Tobey Maguire was somebody that I was a naysayer on. I didn't understand who this guy was. I didn't know him. When I, my 10 year old brain, I was like, if I don't know this guy, he shouldn't be Spider-Man. It should be like an A-lister like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Bruce Willis. And then I see him in action. I'm like, that's Spider-Man. That's, that's him, that's Peter Parker. And that's always been the version of the character that I have gravitated towards. I think that he has the most emotion as far as his historic story arc that has been going through multiple different waves. You could easily argue that for Andrew Garfield, but his storyline got cut off right at the emotional climax. So a lot of his arcs in those first three films regarding his relationships with Mary Jane, Uncle Ben, and uh, Harry Osborn, they all come to a nice little crescendo. They all come to a nice little close. And so even if we never got to see him again, I feel like as is, he's the Spider-Man that has the most wholly realized story arc and it feels the most complete. And so No Way Home, seeing him walk through that portal was just like instant nostalgia for me. I loved it. That was one of my favorite parts of the film. So this is one of those comic book characters that's just always going to be near and dear to my heart. Number eight is Marty McFly from Back to the Future. Back to the Future is one of my favorite films of all time. It's the one film out there that I think is the easiest film to try to have that argument of what is a perfect movie? Is there a perfect movie? Well, if there ever was, it was titled Back to the Future. And Marty McFly was easily one of the reasons why. I almost put Doc Brown on this list. He came very close, but Marty McFly is definitely the character I prefer of the two. And it's because of how flawed that he is. It's because he has such a great personality. All of that, all of that charm that uh, early Michael J. Fox was able to bring out in a lot of his characters was most on screen for Marty McFly. But I love all of his flaws to where his arrogance, his ego, his, his very fractured and sensitive ego in the second film and the third film especially, where anybody calls him chicken is just like, he has to stop and do whatever they challenge him to. I love where he rises to the occasion for everything that he has to go through in the first film, trying to get his parents back together and almost becoming the uh, object of his mother's desires. Talk about a wild mind fuck that must have been. And he's just one of the, for the trilogy being damn near perfect, he's one of the more perfectly realized movie characters to where everything that we start off knowing about this character in the first film comes to a nice little close in the third film. Number seven is going to be Rocky Balboa. Now, the Rocky franchise has been one of the most awesome franchises to watch because it's still going and it's one of the few character studies where you get to see a character in every single stage of his life. He's this young guy from the wrong side of the tracks with a heart of gold in the first film. And then throughout those six films, he rises to be the champion. He falls again, gets his humanity back. And you see all of his relationships and the character dynamics between him and Adrian and him and Pauly go through these different little stages in his life. Then eventually he turns into this mentor and trainer for Adonis Creed and Creed and Creed II. And it's just one of those characters that constantly evolves and you always get to see growth. You always get to see something tied back to a previous movie. And it's just one of those few gems in story writing to where you never feel like you got cut off from a character too soon or you like had this longing to go back and see what they've been up to because we've never not seen what Rocky has been up to. And at no point in his life, with the exception of maybe Rocky V, has there been a point to where we're not captivated by what he's currently going through? You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit, 
It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. I love what the character stands for. I love the heart of gold and these like life lessons that we learn from watching Rocky films. I, I love how we see his own flaws be a cost for him at certain points and how he learns and triumphs over that. I love how his mistakes and his flaws, he kind of tries to imprint onto Adonis and tries to get him to be better than he ever was and not have to learn those hard life lessons like he really had to learn in Creed too. So one of those characters that really, until the horrible day comes that Sylvester Stallone leaves this earth, I don't ever want to not know what's going on with Rocky. Number six is gonna be Caesar from the modern Planet of the Apes trilogy. I think this is probably the best trilogy of films that we have gotten in 10, 15 years. I mean, these are three basically perfect films. And the second one is my favorite. It's one of my favorite films of all time, easily above the other two, which is a tall order because they're so damn good. But what makes this character so incredible. One is that he's digital. He's completely made up, which consistently shows the magic of performance capture and the talent of Andy Serkis. And the way that we get introduced to this character and the way that they pitched to the audience with the first trailer, what this rise of the Planet of the Apes was gonna be about, could have very easily had just been this kind of throwaway, really good looking CGI character and put the focus on the human characters and how they react to Caesar. But they did a genius move about making Caesar the emotional arc of that film. Take your stinking bar off me, you damn 38! No! And how he learns to be a part of humanity and then gets that stripped away from him and then eventually learns how to triumph over humanity. And the way that he rises to be this leader and this almost messiah throughout the second and the third film and endures like incredible loss to the point where the fact that he's a non-human character matters nothing to, to your emotions because you feel for this guy like he was a living, breathing creature. And the way that he just goes through all the trials and tribulations of this three movie arc, this war that eventually spawns between apes and humans. You're so captivated by this character and you're so invested in everything that he has endured that you almost root against your own species. You almost want humans to lose and for Caesar and the apes to triumph. And that's an incredible feat. You know, it's pretty hard to get humans to not root for humans. Even if humans are being shitbags, you're like, I'm gonna live, fuck that, fuck the apes. Nope, <laughs> not in this case. You're like, we deserve to die. The apes are awesome. Caesar, you're the man. Number five, you guessed it. That man with the knives in his hand. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, that's right. Number five for me is Hugh Jackman's version of Wolverine. And I think that especially with that footnote that we got in Logan, this might be the greatest overarching performance that anybody has ever given for a comic book character. I know people are very passionate with certain ones and you know maybe one standalone movie that this actor did that was great or somebody like Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man who's just been kind of the heartbeat of the MCU. But whether or not you love all of the X-Men films or not, I don't think anybody has fully just encompassed a character and just literally became the character on screen the way that Hugh Jackman did from that first X-Men film all the way to Logan. The way that we get to see so many different shades of this guy from so many different emotions to the way that he is introduced into this world of the X-Men to the way that he starts to be one of the leaders of the X-Men and endures loss with some of the events that happen throughout those films like Jean Grey or that last stand thing where Charles dies for five minutes and all of that, I mean, going all the way through to where you get to Logan, and even though that's kind of its own standalone story, it acts very much as a closeout for his character arc and, and just his time as Wolverine. All of the things, all of the, the, the wear, and all of just the grime that his life has left on his soul that is on display in that movie, is just unlike other comic book films. Like Logan still to me is one of those comic book films that transcends the genre to the point where it feels like an insult to call it a comic book film. And so when you get to the ending of that movie and he has his end of his story arc with Patrick Stewart's Professor X and he gets introduced to this little girl who's basically his surrogate daughter and he gives up his immortality finally 
to save her. And just the way that it closes out the movie with those lines where he's dying and he's like, so this is what it feels like. It's just when you're with a character for decades and you love that portrayal of the character the way that I and a lot of us love the way that Hugh Jackman just dedicated everything to Wolverine. Just thinking about it kind of gets me choked up. So that is one of those comic book characters that just the performance by an actor to me is synonymous with the character. And for a character that's been around for generations, to have an actor that only played him for like 20 years come in and become synonymous with that character, it, it just speaks to the power of that performance. So I love Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Number four is going to be Chucky. I love, I live, and I breathe Chucky. This is one of my favorite villains, one of my favorite movie characters of all time. I just love the way that there's so many different aspects to the character that we love about him. I love his sick, twisted, dark humor. I love his laugh. I love how brutal he gets. I love how just unrelentingly horrible of a person that Chucky is. And it speaks volumes how much the character is just on screen electric when he can just continuously do the most heartless shit in every single movie, especially once you start getting into like Bride of Chucky onward where he technically has a family, he has kids, he has a wife and just does not give a flying fuck about any of them at the end of the day. Chucky has been one of the most important movie characters ever for me as far as kind of my journey as a, a movie fan. He was the first horror film I ever saw and was what really made me a horror fanatic and eventually over years and years of movie fandom led to me creating this channel in a very indirect way. I love the way that the performance of Brad Dorif and the voice acting is just continuously on fire for the most part. Not so much in Cult. That was the only movie I thought that was a little lackluster, but for the most part, he always just embodies the character and just brings him to life in new sick, twisted ways. The animatronics and the look of the doll, for the most part throughout this series, has always been really good and consistent. So to the point where we now are decades after the first film, still in the same continuity, and now he has made the leap to television and did a pretty damn good leap for my money in the first season of Chucky. It's one of the few movie characters that has had the lifespan that he has had. And I think everything about that just speaks to how awesome and iconic the character of Chucky is. Number three is Freddy Krueger. Easily my favorite horror villain. Well, I say easily. Him and Chucky are basically neck and neck. But those two, easily my favorite horror villains of all time. Chucky made me a horror fan. Freddy solidified my horror fandom to where there was a point in time where I would not go to sleep. I would not want to go to sleep until you put on a Nightmare on Elm Street movie, which sounds funny because I was like five years old. Most kids would just piss their pants at the thought of even watching a horror film hours before bed, where that was kind of like my comfort zone. I wanted to watch Nightmare on Elm Street 4 before I went to sleep. And so he is one of those characters that is just, just like with Brad Dorff, the way that he, the way that Robert Anglin always realizes the character in a specific way and the way that his physical and voice performance always brings Freddy to life in, in a, just a very stylistic way to where he basically created the character with his own mannerisms and the way that he stands and walks and the way that he says certain things and that iconic laugh and everything about him being a character similar to Chucky to where his sick twisted humor and his sick sense of humor before it started to go way too far in, in five and six especially was just like another layer of the character that made us love him. Nobody watches Dream Warriors and roots for the Dream Warriors. They all root for Freddy. <laughs> you got this guy who is a sick, twisted piece of shit that's continuing to kill people in their dreams and we're like, fuck yeah, bring me more of that guy, he's awesome. Number two, I'm gonna slightly cheat a little bit and say that it's the T-800 from the Terminator franchise. Now the cheat being that every single one of these movies is technically a different Terminator, so Really, it's a different character each movie, but for the most part, we, stylistically, we're, we're watching the same character to a certain degree. And a lot of the same things that I said about Sarah Connor, to where I just adore the first two films, especially the second film, and, and predominantly the second film is where I love this character and his arc and the way that they bring this lifeless robot to life with the script writing, to where he is... The villain in the first movie, he's this unstoppable killing machine. He's fucking Jason Voorhees in that first film. And then in the second film, they flip that switch and swap it around, and now he is the protector, and he becomes the 
father figure for John Connor and kind of becomes a surrogate husband to a certain degree for Sarah Connor throughout some of that movie to where they as a team are the ones who are trying to protect John and set him on this right path. And the way that the Terminator is so lifeless and devoid of emotion and devoid of any understanding of human emotion when the movie starts to where his relationship with John Connor evolves him to a certain degree through the runtime to where when you get to the final five or ten minutes and no man can watch that movie without crying or at least getting emotional when the Terminator wipes the tear off of John Connor and says, I know now why you cry, but I, something I can never do. And then lowers him into the steel and you get that music and that awesome fucking score and it ends with the thumbs up, oh, fighting back dude tears right now. And again, I'm one of the few people that appreciate the direction that we got in Dark Fate. I like the fact that you got this Terminator that fulfilled his mission and then now what? Now what do I do? And because his life had no purpose at that point, he had to discover what purpose in life actually was. I know you can easily make jokes about the fact that he's got a human name, and there's even an in-joke in the movie with that where Sarah Connor says, I'm never going to fucking call you that. But I like the way that the Terminator that finally succeeded in taking out John Connor by the end of the film is taking out Terminators to honor John Connor's name. I thought there was a lot of profound details in that storyline. So again, I know I'm on an island with everything that I've said in this video with Dark Fate, but everything that they have done for the most part with the T-800 throughout this franchise, with the exception of maybe the talk to the hand line and some shit like that, I just think has been fascinating. And especially in those first two films, just one of the most iconic movie characters of all time. Now for my number one, I gotta be honest, I tried and I tried to think of a character that would overtake this guy as my number one, because it just seemed like such an obvious answer for me to give. But every single person that I looked at, I just could not find one. As many of the ones that I love, the ones that I just talked about, that I just adore, none of them come close to John McClane for me. This is just a character that not only is the star of my favorite film, Die Hard, but he's everything that I go to the movies for. He's everything that I continuously go back to Die Hard for. It's just because of that character. He's 90% of the reason. I love the attitude. I love the humor. I love the way that he's just an everyday man. He kind of broke the stigma of these big chiseled, oiled up shirtless bodies in the 80s that had to be your action heroes and gigantic spectacle explosions on screen. No, it's just a regular fucking guy that wants to save his wife and all these hostages. He's balding, he's in good shape, but he's not necessarily like the biggest, baddest motherfucker around, but he rises to the occasion because of his intellect, because of his sarcastic mouth, the way that he just mentally fucks with Hans Gruber and all the other terrorists. And even escaping that first film, I love the way that this character has been in pretty much all of the sequels with the exception of the one that we don't talk about. And he's a character that grows throughout the franchise to where even by the fourth film, he kind of takes on the I'm too old for this shit role. And he's kind of the the end joke that could have been by a, a much lesser movie been this blunt, blunt end of a, the aging guy that doesn't understand the Internet and all those weird things. But they do that in a way to where it just kind of reinforces how caveman badass John McClane is. When he's in this room and then you've got fucking Kevin Smith and Justin Long over there like, this guy doesn't know anything. Oh my God, this is what I've been dealing with. And we're just like, so he'll fucking kill all of you right now with one punch. I really hope that at some point we get a redemption for this character, a movie that's gonna wipe a good day to die hard from our memory completely. But even with that film in existence, I can easily ignore that. Look at the first four Die Hard films and tell you that that is the greatest action hero of all time for me. So what do you guys think? What are your 10 favorite movie characters? I know that there's a lot of characters out there that are super iconic, that are the easy choices on most people's lists that were not on this one, but did you click on this to see your list or to see mine? Let me know yours down below. I'm sure Vader will be down there. I'm sure Indiana Jones will be down there. James Bond. Give me some unique picks. I'm sure you guys like those, but give me some unique picks down below and let's talk about our favorite movie characters. Be sure to check the video description below for that deal for HelloFresh. It's definitely an awesome thing for families especially, so check that out down below. You will not be disappointed. Also check out the link to my Patreon to find out how to become one of the participants in future Patreon picks. And of course, that Patreon exclusive companion video, 10 more of my favorite movie characters of all time is live right now 
over on Patreon. So check it out if you want to experience that. Thank you guys for watching. As always, like and share this video to help this video succeed. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss next week's Patreon pick video, which we're going to be talking about my top 10 favorite standalone horror films. Thank you for watching once again. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.